Thank you for tuning in to Transformation Church's YouTube channel. If you have enjoyed this video, please click the like button as it does help our channel and our church grow. If you would like to find out more information about who we are, would like to join our virtual campus, would we like a prayer request, or would like to donate to our video ministry, please see the link below in the description for our website and our contact information. Transformation Church, and we're about to begin on um, the second of, actually there's going to be three of these. Next week will be a continuation as well. But last week, we, how to walk in great peace every day of your life. <laughs> and guess what? Every time I have to speak a sermon, have a sermon or whatever, it's because I've walked through some things and I get to share it with you. But um, if we ever needed peace, we need it now. Amen? If anyway, I mean, there's just a lot of stuff going on out there right now. So we're going to open in prayer. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I thank you for giving us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive what you have for us. I pray, Lord, that you would cause us to grasp um, what you want us to have under, understand today, Lord, that we will not just have heard this and then someone say, well, what happened? And we don't know, Father, that we will actually get a hold of this. And we thank you for your word. And we apply it to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. But lift your hands up. Close your eyes. Lift your hands up and say, Father, today I receive whatever you have for me. I receive your wisdom today. I receive your joy today. I receive your peace today. Give me eyes to hear, see, not eyes to hear, eyes to see, <laughs> ears to hear and a pliable heart. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we talked about the fact that um, Ephesians chapter 6, and I don't want to, this is kind of a little quick overview, but Ephesians chapter 6 talks about the fact that we are not wrestling against what? Very good, flesh and blood. So look around, what do you see? Flesh and blood? So when you're, basically what this was all about is offenses, getting offended and how it will stymie your life, it'll stymie your walk, it'll cause you to have total lack of peace and you'll be in turmoil. And so how can we get through that? First, one of the first things we need to know is you're not fighting flesh and blood, you're fighting who? Satan. It says in, in, um, that you're fighting principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness. So, you know, even though a lot of the world doesn't want to admit there is a heaven, there is a hell, there are angels, there are demons, all that stuff exists just because we can't see it. You can't see the atoms either, or, or what is that, a quark? Is that what you said the smallest thing is now, a quark? Quark? A quark. But those chairs you're sitting in right now are made out of lots of little tiny itty-bitty quarks that you can need a major, major magnification to see. And yet we have faith to sit down in that chair and know it'll hold us up. But there's a lot of stuff going on that you can't see in the natural realm. So when you see somebody or they say something to you that really offends you or gets you upset, you're not fighting that person. You're fighting the enemy. And we talked about how that um, basically Satan is a trapper. He, he sets a bait out for you. We talked about how the, um, the story about the monkey, how do they trap monkeys? Does anyone remember the story? All right, uh, we, need a, we need a microphone here because Kayla is doing very well here. She's got a good, yeah, you know, well, they can't hear it. All right, I'll tell you. Kayla's too shy, but she w said that she did remember. They have this cage, and the monkey's too smart to walk in the front door of the thing. They'll leave the, the gate open for him to go in. They're too smart for that. So what they do is they have, like you said, they have like a banana, which they love bananas, uh, some kind of bait, and they, it's on a stick, and it's called a trap stick. And so what the monkey will do, he'll go, and he'll, instead of going inside of the, the cage, he'll go and he'll reach his arm in to try to get that bait trap stick. And he wants the, and, but it, they made it to where he can't pull the stick through. It's too fat to go through the, the um, thingies. So when he's trying to pull, but he doesn't want to let go because he wants that bait. And so the monkey will just keep pulling. And when they're doing that, what they'll do is they'll either hit him on the head to kill him or they capture him and put him in a um, cage, and that's just... I know it's sad, but <laughs> it's true. And that's what Satan does to us. He knows what the bait is, and he'll, he won't come in a way that you're gonna ignore, you, you can tell and you're smart enough to say, hey, I've been there. I, I see what you're doing. He does it in a way if something you really want, and he puts that bait out there, and you're just hanging on to it. And if, unless you let, learn to let go of the bait of Satan, you're in trouble because he's either going to kill you 
or capture you and imprison you, and that's the truth. And you're imprisoned whenever you have unforgiveness or offenses in your life. It's a prison. And um, been there, done that, don't like going there, don't want to go there again because it's not a good place to be. Amen? So um, without there again, I want to kind of go briefly through this. We didn't discuss this, but the fact is, how many know the story about Daniel, and he prayed, and it took 21 days for the answer to come? Well, it says in Dan, it's in the book of Daniel, and he prayed, and, and the angel, he prayed, and he said, the angel came to him and said, I, I heard you, the, f- the first day I was sent here with the answer, but I had to wrestle with the prince of Persia. The prince of Persia is a demonic force. So wh- what's basically happening, we're here on the earth, There's a second heaven, which is where the demons and the angels are warring and things are going on. And then the third heaven is heaven where God is. So in between where God is and where we are, as far as there's three layers. So the first layer is the earth, where we're living. The second layer is where the the principalities and powers of the darkness are ruling. And then the third is the third heaven. So the first, second, and third heaven. So basically, um, they're in their warring. It took them 21 days. So we're not fighting flesh and blood. We're fighting principalities and powers of the darkness, and we got to keep that in mind. So from the first day he was sent out, but there are things that we cannot see that are just as real, and we need to recognize that that's going on. Another Bible story, without going into all this, because I couldn't get through half of the sermon last time week because I get so many notes, I get so excited. Um, but Elisha, I don't know if you remember this, but Elisha, um, they were going to, to battle, and he had a servant with him. And he's going, what are we going to do? It's just you and me against. He said, Lord, open up my servant's eyes. And when he opened up his servant's eyes, he saw all of these chariots all round about them ready for battle. And it was angelic host there realized, I mean, there was, there was no battle. It was already won. And that's called discerning of spirits, too, which is another subject we could get into. But discerning of spirits, a lot of people think that that's, um, you know, when you call about the different gifts of the spirit, a lot of people think that's just, oh, I just knew that about them. Well, that's just, a lot of times it's called suspicion or in, intuition. or But a real true discerning of spirits is when you can recognize, you could, you, some people see angels, they see demonic forces. Um, whether you see them or not, they're there. But it's called discerning of spirits. So at that point, discerning of spirits kept, you know, got there where he could see what was going on. So if God were to open our eyes today, and some people never see anything, does that make you less spiritual? No. Absolutely not. We're all different. That's why we need each other. Some of us, I tend to be a person, see, I see a lot of things in the spirit. Always have from this little, I didn't know what was going on, but I always have. And um, just the way I am. But other people, that they just never see anything else, and they're just as powerful, if not more powerful, than I am in the spirit and seeing things going on because that's just not something that they walk in that much. But there are just, there are things going on. The Bible says we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. So if God were to open all of our eyes right now, you would realize there's a, we're flooded with angels and the cloud of witnesses up there watching, you know, going, come on, you can do it, rooting us on. There's just all kinds of wonderful things happening. And the one thing we need to remember is we never need to fear Satan because greater is he who's where? In us than he that's in the world. So you have nothing to fear. I know so many times when churches and stuff get into this stuff, they, they make it like this great big devil and this tiny little God. That's because the devil has a totally messed up because it's true big God, <laughs> little devil. It's only going to take one of the angels. If you look in Revelation, only one angel to take Satan and his whole group and throw him in the pit at the final end. And if it's only going to take, cause Jesus isn't even going to bother He's just going to say, uh, angel number whatever, you go, and you do it. That's how lack of power the enemy has. Now, he only has, and, and, I, and I want you to say this to your neighbor after I'm done saying it, Satan only has the power I give him. Satan only has the power I give him. So we need to recognize you don't have to give him any power. And the more we learn to walk with him, the less and less power he has in our life, the less and less entrance we'll give him because we're getting wiser. We got that wisdom of God working. And the Bible says in, in James, I think it's chapter 1, it talks about if we ask for wisdom in the Amplified, it says he will give it to us liberally and without fault finding. So if you're lacking wisdom, we need to ask for wisdom, and we need to just get in the word of God and start following and doing what God says, and that's going to keep us out of a lot of trouble. Amen? So there's demonic spirits, and there's angelic spirits out there, but we win. Amen.
So look around again. Who's around you? Flesh and blood. You're not fighting whoever it is you think you're fighting. You're fighting the enemy. Amen? I'm not fighting whoever. I'm fighting the enemy. If the enemy is using someone as an offense to, to you, what is very important for you to do? Does anyone remember? He's, he's using somebody against you. What is your, what's important about that? What do you need to do? What? Forgive. Forgive. Well, that's good. But it's, the important thing is how do I respond? Check your response when you get offended. Because I know, I've told you, I mean, I've, there were times I wanted to just plain old slap somebody. I was <laughs> just, psh, like, I'm over it. Get out of my face before I slap your face. But I've never slapped anyone, just so you know, I've never. But how many have felt that way? Oh, I used to have a real issue, especially when we were traveling. I said, God, thank you that I'm saved. Because I had this thing about people um, expect. <sighs> If you've done any traveling at all, I think everyone's run into the situation where there's some kind of road construction or something going on, there's an accident, and you're held up. And there's always some nice person who decides, I don't play by the rules, and I don't care how long you've been sitting there. I'm going to just come up here and just go up at the side of the shoulder of the road or something and sneak in, which makes you sit there longer and longer because there's a bunch of those kind of people. I would just get, ugh. you know, I'm, I'm just being honest. I, I know none of you, I see the halos, they're just shining, they're beaming and it's blinding me right now. But the truth is, seriously, that was one of my pet peeves. And with traveling for three years, and we were on the vehicle a lot, and this kind of stuff happening on a regular basis, and I said, man, I'd look at him and say, you better be glad I'm saved, because if I had a gun, I'd shoot your tires out. Because <laughs> I really was that, I was offended, literally. You can be offended at a situation, you know, because there's a group of people out there, and I didn't even know their name. I wouldn't know them if I saw them somewhere, but I was offended at them. So you can get offended at some. You don't even know them. You can get. I've had situations where someone said, um, "You know, you ne- you don't. You better not go over. <laughs> I should be careful, but you better not go over to that church because you know such and such and so and so, and you've not even met the pastor or the whatever, and and then someone will say their name, and you're thinking all of a sudden it's like, oh bad feeling comes on you because that person said that and you're maybe not an offense but yet you are you've already prejudged that person because of something someone else said which is probably not true anyway truthfully I mean you know when people get upset they can say all kinds of things so we have to even it's not just this your husband or your wife or your son or your daughter or your or your pastor or your um your boss, your coworkers, I mean, the, the things that you would think naturally. It can be in a group of people you could get mad at. Um, you can get mad at a telephone company. I almost got in real deep trouble that way once. We, we, we were with a certain company, and we had finished our contract. We were months, you know, we decided we were just going to change. We had been with them for seven years. We had been six months over that without contract, just paying the payment. And they kept telling me that I wasn't released from my contract. And I just kept saying, well, give me a manager, because I used to work in customer service, so I've got to know how that works. And, and I know if you've got to get something done, well, I, they would not listen to me. And this here, mighty woman of God, all this stuff. And I said, what do I have to do? Come down there and blow someone's head off for somebody to listen to me and get this right. No, I didn't. But <laughs> I did not. I was very livid, and I was very ugly. And he says, ma'am, you're threatening me, and I'm going to have to hang up now. I said, don't hang up. Whatever you do, don't hang up. I'm handing the phone to my husband, but don't you hang up. I've been on the, uh, two hours on the phone trying to get somebody to listen to me. Seriously, that is not even an exaggeration. This is the second or third time that I've ta- tried to talk to somebody to tell them, I don't owe you any money. My contract's been done for six months. I've got proof. Nobody will listen. How many of you, This is one of those cases where I actually was in the right. I didn't do anything wrong. Well, I did at that point. I thought, oh, great, now they're going to send these people out. This lady's got a bomb she's going to bring down to the... And and I wasn't thinking that. I was just, you know, blowing off steam. So I hand the phone to my husband, and I guess, unfortunately, it worked because I had, unfortunately, in that case, getting that ugly is what it took for them to finally do the right thing. But um, there again, none of you. And it depends. Some people just don't get all that upset. Um, I I don't know. I I used to blame it on my hot Italian blood, but... um, 
just the devil. It was the devil. I let him in because I got offended. I got like, I, you do, and I know none of you have said this either. You sometimes have to wonder, is there any intelligent life out there when you're dealing on the phone? And try, or what about these automatic phone systems? If you want to speak in English, press 1. For Spanish, press 2. All right, you're already off to a good start right there. Okay. If you want this, that, or the other, press that. You've pressed so many buttons, but and you still can't get what it is you're looking for because what you're looking for is not a normal question. Although they've got their slated normal questions, I understand. Nobody gets upset at that, do you? All right. Do we have chances to be offended every day? Absolutely. And I know no one's getting offended right now during this election time when you see the, um, what do you call it, the advertisements, right? Nobody gets upset when you see the advertisements on there. And um, let's see, I, my name is such and such, and I approve this message. <laughs> I, I told my husband I was going to say, I am Pastor Becky, and I approve this message. <laughs> but you know what? It can get you, it really can get you angry and ag agitated. For one thing, for some of us, I don't want to see another one of those commercials. You know, so you, you if you want to walk in peace, somehow we got to recognize, let it roll. You know, we need to be like a rain, you know, the rain coat with the rubber stuff and just let it kind of roll off of us rather than being, like we said before, like a Velcro and it just sticks to you and you got to yank it off. Don't let that stuff get to you. So the Satan will use these things to wear you down, to wear you down. One of the ways I heard, I think Kenneth Copeland, somebody was saying it, how, to describe what Satan does to you, it's kind of like, you know, when if, if you have kids, no offense for any children, but mom, 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 mom. Mom, mom, you know how they, see, you know, mom, mom. That's what the devil does to you. He just keeps agitating, agitating, agitating. So he doesn't have to be that big. He's just an agitator. And so he keeps you out of peace so that if you're not getting enough sleep, stuff's going on, all this stuff, you know, you're bound to blow. You're bound to get offended at something and, or someone. And so you have to recognize, too, sometimes we get offended just because we're just tired. You know, we've just had a bad day or whatever. Amen? It's good preaching. <laughs> so we need to see that we respond correctly. Say, I need to respond correctly. All right, Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, if you have your Bibles or your phone and you can look it up on your Bible app. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. And I'm going to read it out of the NIV this time. Be surprised. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go up to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. That shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God but the things of man. Get behind me who? Notice the first thing is Jesus didn't even talk to Peter. He talked to the real problem, Satan. Now think about this. Jesus was 100% man and 100% God. He, it says in Hebrews chapter 4, remember we talked about this last week, he is a high priest and he sympathizes with our weaknesses because he was tempted in the same way that we're tempted, yet he did not sin. So Jesus did, went through all this. He knows what you feel like. He knows what you're going through. He understands, and you have to understand, he understands and he sympathizes, and it's going to be okay. So when he rebukes Peter, he, or Satan, he was not rebuking Peter, so to speak. Does that make sense? And I don't, I, I don't admonish anyone to go out there and the next time someone is offending you and say, I rebuke you, Satan, <laughs> you know. We, um, you know, you really better hear God before you do that because you talk about them getting offended. But think about it. Jesus only did what he heard the Father say to do, and he only said what the Father said to say. He had gotten that down. Peter hadn't gotten that down yet, obviously. And neither have we, more than likely. I know I haven't. To only, you know, to get, and I keep asking, Lord, give me ears to hear what the Spirit's saying. Give me eyes to see. Help my heart be pliable. Because I, I want everything that he has for me. And the more we walk in the things of God and more that we get into the Word of God, the better our life is, for real. You walk in a peace that people, it's a peace that passes all understanding. When my husband was going through, um, you know, being flown from Altamont Hospital over to um, 
Rollins, whatever, Florida South, um, in the middle of a heart attack, he, he, you know, he's described this before without going into it, but he said it's a piece that you can't even, he had no issues with anyone. If he died, it would be okay. He didn't have anything out there that he would wish he had said to somebody or because he had his, his conscience was clear. He was good. At the same time, I had this peace that everything was going to be all right. Now, that's something you get from God, because this is not a time when you're normally going to be peaceful. How many would agree? I really, seriously, there, it's a peace I can't even, we, we just haven't had any, uh, for one thing, you know, we also have made the, we know that we're not going a day before it's our time. We're in his hands. We have nothing to worry about. No, you don't either. So when you get to that point, Jesus knew God, you know, he was, well, he was God, but he was man. So he had learned to listen to the Father. And whether people want to realize this or not, it said he was tempted in the same ways that we're tempted, right? That was a temptation that the devil was using Peter to tempt Jesus with. No, I mean, you're not going to suffer on the cross. That, that never, that's just not going to happen. Well, don't you think Jesus would have liked to have agreed with that? I <laughs> know I would. Oh, yay, I'm going to be beaten to a pulp. You won't even recognize me. Uh, you know, I'm going to go through all of this stuff. Well, so Satan really was using Peter to get to Jesus. So he had to say, stop it. He had to nip it in the bud and say an offense. And what did he say to Peter? Peter, he said, you don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. If we can be mindful of the things of God, we'll make better choices. We'll, you know, we won't say the wrong things because we'll be more conscious of the heaven and what we're in the word of God and what he's saying. Them. And it's hard because we're inundated with the world. The world's all over the place, obviously. You turn on the TV. But if we can just get more time into knowing who God is, spending time in, in the word, and, and walking the way he tells us. The Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd. I will not want. That word also means lack. That means if you follow him, no, even if you walk through the shadow of death, which we did, I will fear no evil. We're living proof. We've done this. It's true. Not, I mean, there was zero fear. Zero fear. Just knew, uh, just a piece of God. Uh, you know, so we just need to follow the shepherd, and he's the shepherd, and the shepherd's not going to lead you into an offense. He's not going to lead you into unforgiveness, because what is unforgiveness? Unforgiveness is wanting someone to drink poison that you're drinking instead. You know, you're upset. And I, I, sh I shared this last week as well. There was a person that was offended with me, and a year or something later I found out about it. Did it hurt me for that whole couple of years? No. Hurt them. You know, they were poisoned against me, but it didn't touch me because I didn't even know about it. And as soon as I found out, I apologized. I had no idea. So when you're upset with somebody, you're, it's like you're just saying, you know, I'm going to drink this poison because I'm mad at you. And, and you're poisoning yourself, and you're causing yourself to get sick and, you're, and all of these things. That you're opening the door for the enemy to come into your life. Nobody wants to do that. So it's get me behind me who? Get thee behind me who? Satan, not Peter. Jesus loved Peter. So when somebody offends you, look past them and get mad at the devil and love the person. And it's not always easy to do. But the more that we, if we really believe the word of God, it's the truth. And that's where it comes. Do we really believe it's true? Then we have to look past that offensive person. Now, they, like I said before, they might have, you might have been sodomized. You might have had incest. You might have had someone that verbally abused you. You might have had a teacher that said you were never going to make it. Words do hurt. You know, we used to say as ki kids, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Yes, words hurt you. Words can actually determine things off in your life. So we need to speak encouraging words to ourselves. We need to speak encouraging words to others. We need to speak life. And when someone does say something to you, I just heard recently, my brother was telling me, he lives in, in um, my one brother lives in Charlotte, North Carolina, and his pastor was talking about a pastor friend of his, and his daughter was um, going to, I think it was middle school, um, and some kid came up and said, get out of this, away from this table at the lunch thing. This is our, my table or whatever. She says, I'm not moving. He began to tell her how ugly and stupid and blah, blah, blah she was. And you know, at that age, it's, it's even, you know, it's bad enough at our age, but at that age, that's just like, I can remember one pimple being like total disaster. My day was ruined. You know, because I'm going to go to school and everybody's going to see that one, you know, that one flaw. And um, and if we only, you know, if you, don't you wish you knew then what you know now? I mean, but we didn't, and that's part of life. So she, she came home and told her dad, and um, she was crying, and he said, well, let's just sit down and see what the Bible says about you, smart daddy. 
opened up the Bible, and he said, you know, you're the apple of his eye. The Bible says your, ins- your name is inscribed on the palm of his hand. So he went through the Bible saying that, you know, you have wisdom. If you need it and you lack it, he'll give you wisdom. So you're intelligent. You have the mind of Christ. He went through all of these and used it as a teaching tool to teach her, and she just snapped out of it because that is the truth. The truth is the word of God. Absolutely no labels. You know, I don't care if they label you. Um, what are some of the labels now? EH or whatever the different labels are. That's not what God says about you. That may be what you're walking through right now, but what God says is by Jesus Christ stripes, you are healed and made whole. And God's got the whole world for us, and he's got all kinds of provisions and stuff for us. We need to speak life over ourselves. We need to speak life over our children. We need to speak life over our coworkers, over our spouses. And, and even when people have done something wrong, there are things that are atrocious things that have been done to people. I have been totally amazed by um, Joyce Meyer's testimony. You all know Joyce Meyer, right? Um, her dad basically raped her for years and years and years and years and just did some horrible things and um and god she had to forgive him now i I feel the holy spirit lead me to say this we need to be careful about forgiveness forgiveness in her case because she learned that she had to forgive she actually took her children and left them with her mom and dad and her dad molested the daughters and because she was it was forgiveness gone awry I don't know how else to describe this, and she's, she's shared this. So when you know that somebody is a sexual offender or you know abusive verbally, however it is, you can forgive that person, but you certainly don't have to go in for more. And that's not taught enough. I don't think it is. You know, if your husband or, is it, you know, if you're abused by your spouse or whoever, it, you know, even a, a coworker or whatever, you know, you need to remove yourself from those situations. God did not make you to be the punching bag. He didn't make you to take on all of that stuff that's not his will for your life and you have to trust him that you know because a lot of times women stay in such uh, abusive relationships because well what do i do i i can't make it financially without them or whatever but i have i'm i'm standing here to tell you god will make a way god will make a way um i I, there's confidences, so there's some things I can't share, but I'm telling you, I have seen over and over again, because I don't want anyone to even try to relate situations, that it looked impossible, but the person got their child out of harm way from an abusive parent, uh, father, or whatever, molesting the, the child, or different things like that, and it looked impossible, but God pr- miraculously provided, because we've helped different people get out of situations. And um, there is a way. So... Re- Forgiveness isn't staying in a, an abusive relationship, okay? You don't, con- that, that's, you know, there are offenses that we do not have to tolerate. And there are, I mean, there's just so many other options out there, and the, the devil will keep you blinded because he wants to keep you there, and, and he wants to keep you under the thumb of somebody like that. You don't need to stay there. Now, if they repent and, and, and there's a way to work it out, great. But how many of you have seen on TV where the, the person has had like um what is it called, a restraining order? Because there's already been problems, but nobody really follows up on them, and the person ends up dead. So we need, you know, use wisdom. Once again, when we're wo- dealing with offenses, yes, the devil's using them, but if they keep committing themselves to the devil and letting the devil use them, you need to get out of harm's way. I don't know how to make it any clearer. Get out of that situation. And God will make a way, even if you think you can't. You can. There'll be some, he'll work something out. Amen? So, what was the root? The root was Satan, not Peter. And anybody you're offended at, the root is what? Satan. It's not the person that you're dealing with. Amen? Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, about love. It says, love is not conceited, arrogant, inflated with pride. This is amplified. It's not rude, unmannerly. It does not act unbecomingly. Love, God's love in us, does not insist on its own rights or its own way. It's not self-seeking. It's not touchy or fretful or resentful. It takes no account of the evil done to it. It pays no attention to a suffered wrong. And I've said before, (laughs) that's hard. If we're honest, that is a tough thing to live up to. But the closer we can get to where we're walking in God's love, the less we will offend people and the less we will be offended. Is that true? Yeah, right. 
And it is. How many of you have ever met? I, I hear the spirit saying this. I'm kind of surprised. How how have you? How many of you ever met somebody that just get offended all the time? No, I don't need this. But we all know somebody like that. Well, let's say you're dealing with a person like that, and you're trying not to be a stumbling block to them. You're trying not to get an offense with them, but they're totally offended at you all the time. I mean, they just get offended if you do this, if you do that. They're constantly getting offended at you. What is a person to do? <laughs> Because I've been there. I mean, especially, I mean, th there's some people that are just like, it's like you don't know how to handle it. I, I think the best way to handle a situation like that is, is to go and ask God to check your heart. There's a scripture that says, um, create in me a clean heart. Show me if there's any wicked way in me. And find out, first of all, am I, you know, is, is there any validity to this? Am I that really that bad? Am I really doing, pushing their buttons? And once you find out and you clear it with God and you know that it's not you, how do you handle a person like that? You just have to love them, but just let that roll. If they keep getting offended, you can't help it if they keep getting offended. Some situations you can. You can, you can make peace with people, but some people are so touchy. They're so not walking in love. They, they're so, you know, so much, it's all about them, it's, it's all about them, and it's all about them. <laughs> And I, and I know we've all met people like that. And they're hard to deal with. They are hard to be, be with. You just love them the best you can, but don't take any of their offense on. Don't, you know, and if they keep saying, well, you just did this to me, you, you know, and you know in your heart, you just, um, how many under, I don't know how else to say this. I hope, am I making sense? Yes? Okay. So when those people are like that, just know that's the way they are because they've chosen not to walk in love, and there's nothing you can do about it. Try to be as gracious as you can around them, but don't feel like I've got to constantly go and apologize to that person because that person just has issues. Hurting people hurt people, right? All right. Remember, Satan is out after the word in your life. He wants to steal the word of God out of your life because the word of God brings you into life and life more abundantly. Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy, and that's John 10.10. 10. So if he can create a hurt, pain, offense, but in life by using people, circumstances, like people driving crazy, situations, he's out to rob the wor word, and it's, he's out to discourage you from applying the word in your life, so he wants to keep you distracted. Get on the word. Stay on the word. Use the word. Um, he will use relationships to affect you, Romans chapter 14, verse 10. This is a good scripture to look at. Romans chapter 14, verse 10. I'm going to read it in the NIV. You then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me and every tongue will confess to God. So then, verse 12, each of us will give an account of our brothers and sisters to God. God, you know what they said. You know what they did. Is that what it says? Each of us will give account of our brothers and sisters to the Lord. No. No. It says in verse 12, so each of us will give account of himself to God. So I'm going to give account of myself, not everybody else. So what do I need to do? Make sure I'm okay. Make sure my heart's right. Make sure your heart's right with God. Because there are, like I said, there are going to be people that will be offended at you and you've not done anything. Um, so what does the Bible say? You give account of who? Yourself. All right, we got it. You give account of yourself. So the most common trick of the enemy is to get your eyes off of, of God and your eyes on people because if we get our eyes on Jesus he becomes the author and the finisher of our faith but we need to keep our eyes on Jesus don't look you know just don't look at that person verse 13 therefore let us stop passing judgment on one another look at brothers and sisters around you right now look at brothers and sisters around you say I am not going to judge you anymore I am not going to judge you anymore I'm not going to judge you anymore. I'm not going to judge you anymore. And we're going to work at that. And that, when that. Isn't that freeing, though? If you don't judge, judge, and you won't be judged. It really does work that way. Most of the time. I mean, there's always those little nitpicky people. All right. So we're not going to judge our, our, our people anymore. We're going to recognize Satan's our enemy. We're not fighting flesh and blood. We're fighting the enemy. His name is Satan. And we need to acknowledge the minute that you feel an offense coming, the first thing that you need to do is acknowledge that you are offended. You can't deal with a problem if you don't even admit you got one. So number one, I have to admit I 
have a problem, which means that what? I am responsible for what? How I respond. She got it. <laughs> how I respond. So um, we need to make sure how, how we respond. So the minute you realize you're offended, because I bet a lot of you, if you listened to last week and you're doing this week, you didn't even realize, but got, some pe people are being brought to your mind and you realize, I am I am offended. I know that happened to me as I was studying this myself. I'm like, uh-oh. And I've recognized some times I've been tempted to be offended. And I've Thankfully now, though I recognize it, so first of all is I nip it in the bud and say, I'm offended. Okay, now what do I do? I'm responsible for how I respond. The first thing you don't want to do is be like they were in the Garden of Eden. What was the first thing? It was that woman you gave me. It was the serpent, the blame game. You know, and, it, and I learned this way, I was, well, I was in high school in a sociology class, but it always stuck with me. She said, you're never going to grow up until you can accept blame. And that's true. You cannot grow up if it's always someone else's fault because you, you never take responsibility for yourself. Amen? So you, you get ready because we've got a little video I want you to see. Uh, and I think it might take him a minute. Did it do something weird? Okay. So last week's focus was basically walking in peace. But part two is the focus today is focus. So hopefully we can focus on this. And I want to make sure he can. What would you say? I'm ready. You all ready? Make sure you can see this. The monkey business illusion. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the monkey business illusion. Learn more about this illusion and the original gorilla experiment at theinvisiblegorilla.com. All right. It's important what we're focusing on, and we can see this. I mean, this, this group that does this, I, I, I got to see this, and the, this is a newer one than what we saw. In a, I, I'm a life coach, and so my life coach training, that was one of the things that we had, and I didn't see the gorilla. <laughs> I was so busy counting, I didn't see it, and then they didn't even have the one leaving, and the curtain's changing. That's updated, because if you've seen it, then it ruins it for you. Then it, so it, you, you, you think, oh, I, I saw it, you know, I saw it. But chances are we don't see everything. And a lot of times when, when we get offended, we're not seeing things correctly because, first of all, we come out of a hurt situation. A lot of times, and I can say it this way, when people le leave another church, if they leave hurt, you know, it's one thing. We've always been, before we were pastoring, we really did pray and ask God, where are we supposed to be? And there are seasons and times. And so when it was time to leave, we left. But we didn't leave out of, all right, I'm offended. I'm leaving here now. We left because God said to. It's so it's very simple, and that's a good thing to do, and be wherever God tells you to be. But a lot of people leave because that pa I'm offended at the pastor. I'm offended at the you know whatever it was. They got offended at somebody, and th so they're leaving. And the problem with that is that you come to the next church, and what's going to happen is you're probably going to have that same thing happen because you haven't dealt with it. So the important thing is, if that's true, then deal with that offense so that you can move forward, because being in an offense stops you. And you're like, you're just stuck. I always say this. My granddaughter, she's two, but 
the older, but she, when she gets in, I stuck, I stuck. And I, I said, boy, that will preach, preach, <laughs> because we get stuck. And we don't realize when we're in offense, you are actually stuck. Because you can't move forward when you're stuck in that offense. You're just sitting there, and you can't do anything about it. So a lot of it has to do with what you're looking at. And you need to just choose, like I said, to start being more like rubber and just letting that roll off of you. Like if somebody pour, poured water on you, just let it roll. Let it go. Because it's going to hurt you more than them anyway. You need to let it go. And, you know, and I know that there have been times I've even said this, they don't deserve me to let it go. I deserve the, to be upset with them. No, you know, and I know none of you again have done that. But I'm gonna. I deserve this, and um, yeah, I deserved it all right. Because the trouble is, is it, it pity parties are fun for a while, or getting angry or whatever. But then they're not fun, and then you're stuck, and it's hard to get out of it because there comes a time. So, watch. You know, focus your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith, and let everything else go. Amen. So the Bible says we look unto Jesus. He's the author and the finisher. And a lot of times we let Jesus author. Okay, I give him, but then we pick up the pen and we start writing the rest of it. Or we start doing, we do. We're all, you know, it's, it's, it's a common thing for us to do. So if we will focus on Jesus, keep our eyes off of, of ourselves and all the stuff that's going on and judging with the wrong spirit, we can learn to walk in love and we can learn to focus on love and, and we'll be a lot happier. Um, I know that many times, like Billy Graham had said, and I always say this wrong, but the basic gist of it is he gets, you get bad press. Even someone like Billy Graham people were criticizing. He'd get um, articles in the newspaper and stuff. Now it would be Twitter and everything else. Um, what do you do with stuff like that so people get into situations where you're just out there for pot shots? Um, there's going to be people out there. We've already, we just barely started this and... Um, I'm not even going to give credence to what it was, but there was already one situation where someone was dis unliking us for a cer certain situation, and I won't even give it the pleasure of saying what it was. But I have to let that go. You know, there's no point, because, like, uh, what, what, what did he say again, Billy Graham? My friends don't need an explanation, and my enemies won't believe me anyway. So if they're really your friend, they're not going to think bad of you, and if they're... Your friends are going to love you no matter what, warts and all. Your friends love you. And the rest of them, who cares? You really need to let that go because what do you care? Don't care. I'm going to tell you right now, just don't care because they've got their issues. And it, you're not fighting them. You're fighting Satan. Satan's using them, but you're not fighting them. So just leave it there. Amen? So when I'm offended, what should I do? There's, now, this is a little more complicated. You're offended at somebody. The right thing to do if it really is bugging you and you can't get rid of it and you're not quite sure whether they meant to do it or not, sometimes you know someone didn't mean to offend you, and that's a whole other thing. But you're not quite sure, just go to them and say, you know what, I don't know if you meant to do this or not, but this really bugs me, and I, I want to get it right. I know that's hard because I know I hate, I hate confrontation, and... How many people, anyone here like confrontation for real? I don't, I don't think I've ever met anyone, very few people in my lifetime that like, all right, let's confront this thing. I'd rather it just go away. I'll be honest with you. I'm, I'm more of a flight than fight person. And um, I have, to, by the time I'm fighting, it's bad. You know, that phone call, it's bad when I'm ready to fight. Because I've let it go and let it go and let it go and let it go. And then kaboom, which is not healthy either, but working on it. But we need to, Go up to them and say, you know, I don't know if you meant that or not, and get it right. Now, if the person says to you, you know, I didn't even realize or whatever, or I'm sorry, um, or what if they don't receive your apology? Um, who's responsible? You or them? Actually, once you've asked them to forgive you and they won't accept any apology, it's their problem. I probably didn't word that properly, did I? Okay, but... You know, so if you've gone to somebody and they won't receive you and they won't let it go, you're done. You don't have to keep going to them. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. No. You've said it. If they can't accept your forgiveness, then move on. That's their problem now. You've done the right thing. I guess what I, was, I started to say is what you thought is what happens if, you know, you go to them and, and um, well, I can't get hit my head around that right now, so I guess I'm not supposed to go there. 
we need to be real careful too. What if you suspect somebody really didn't mean it? You're pretty confident that they didn't. My opinion, I wouldn't even bother. If you can let it go, let it go. Because what happens when you go to somebody and you said, well, you know, you did this and it offended me. Now they've got to deal with an offense because they didn't mean to do it. And they could possibly get offended and this could kind of go on and on. How many could see that? So just ask God for wisdom. So if your heart's right and you can let it go, let it go. If you really feel like you need to confront, just go to them and just and tell them. I don't, because you don't know. And there are some people you can highly suspect they did mean to do it. Uh, thankfully, I haven't had that very often in my life. But there's some people that they get so offended. And I've heard people say this and it's just like, oh, real, you know, oh. But they're like, I'll show them. I'm going to lie about them. I'm going to tell people stuff that's not. I'm like, really? You're, you're, you're like, blah, 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 blah. you really? I mean, I would be, I got enough fear of God in me. I'd pray a, a lightning bolt would strike me or something. That's just, just the way I was raised. But but I have, there are people out there that they really do get offended to the point where they all lie about you. They will start an uh, issue that never was meant to be. And that happens a lot like even with like the Billy Grahams of this world. So it's not just, it, it happens in, no matter where you are. People will lie. Well, at that point, there's this thing going on that people will, is it true or is it not? And it really causes so much damage. So if you're dealing with a person like that, like I said, I, I probably would go to them and say, you know, I, I'm not, I would still probably say I'm, I'm not sure that you meant to do this or not, but I'm, you know, I'm, I have an issue about with this. And if they don't accept it, once again, there's nothing you can do if you've gone to them, Right? Well, it's true. There's nothing. You you know, you don't have to keep on going or feeling any guilt or anything about it. And you do need to forgive them, though, and let them go and realize that God's use. I mean, Satan's using them and, and pray for them because they need prayer. They're hurting. Anyone that's hurting you, you can guarantee they're hurting and they need to be restored to God. Amen? Amen. All right. So when I'm offended, don't assume that you know what the other person is thinking. How many times have we done that? They knew what they were doing. Oh, especially with your spouse. Especially women. Uh, this is a tip for women out there and here. Um, we tend to drop hints. Guys do not get hints. Come here. Come here. My husband here. We've been married. We'll be 35 years in, in um, November. So I'm, I know what I... He says, let the older women teach the younger women. I know what I'm talking about. I used to get so offended, especially when we were first married. I'm like... I knew that he just knew that that's what I, and I, and how dare he, and he'd come in and say, I'm like, yeah, right, you know, or, you know, ooh, baby, I'm like, not now, um, but anyway. <laughs> I'm being real, this is where we live, so w I learned over the years, I wish somebody would have told me this when I was your age, um, to, when you're ta dealing with your husband, when you get married, or a boyfriend, just so you know this, take your hands right there and say, read my lips <laughs> repeat after me i want roses for our anniversary i want roses <laughs> for our anniversary i want to be taken out to dinner uh, all right and then hope that he gets it <laughs> and is it true <laughs> you can actually i could actually answer if i'm watching tv i could answer that and never had heard it a little piece of advice there. So. <laughs> so why get offended? I now know, I mean, I spent a couple years, oh, probably 10 years before it dawned on me, getting upset with him over something that is just who he is as a male. And I love, and we're thankful we have male and female. But, you know, there are those that may be the exception, but this is the rule. Not There are always exceptions to the rule, but this is the rule, right, Mike? Especially if sports are on. And they've said this, and I say this with, you know, you could come out in a very skimpy outfit while the, the game is on, and oh, did they? All and they wouldn't even notice because they're in there, they're in that game. And then after the game, it's like, hey, baby, and you're like, hey, nothing, you know, forget it. So I'm just this. This is just, and you know what? And I used to say we we don't the two things churches aren't supposed to talk about are money and sex. I thought that's our problem. We should have been talking about money and sex. We do need to talk about it because we have the answers. It's in the word of God. Amen?
So we have, it is, it's God's word. So he's got the, he's got the right perspective on this. He knows what we're supposed to do. So some of your offenses may be just that. Guys do not get hints, ladies. Guys do not get hints. And so you have no right to be offended at him because he's just not going to get it. Now, if you put your hands on his face and you say all that and you hope that he gets it and he doesn't get it, you, you, you might have some fighting issues there. But um, usually they will get that much. And, and I have to say this, and oh, I didn't plan to go here, but the Holy Spirit must want to. Guys also, when they want you, when they're dating you, you, you get, yes, <laughs> you have the world on a platter. On a, you know, whatever their best is, you've got it. And that you are the focus of their attention, and they will do anything for you. And then the wedding, of course, it's really about the bride, not much about the groom. And so you have this wedding that you've been, if most of us, that, you know, you were dreaming of, and you have all of these things, and that's it. It's over. I mean, you know, it's like, okay, it's like he's conquered me now and he's on to the next thing. I'm conquering my career or whatever it is they're going on to. And I have to tell you something. Somebody needs to hear this, and I'm saying this by the Spirit. If he's not giving you the world and he's you not first place, you don't need to get married because you are in a bad position already. I mean, if the guy's not head over heels wanting to kiss your toes and you know, <laughs> buy you flowers and do all the things that, that he thinks that you want before you're married, you really need to run and run hard. Amen. Because I'm going to tell you what, you're going to be real lonely in that marriage. Somebody needs to hear that. Run, baby, run. You'll be happier single. And we need to be at peace with that too. Whether you're, you know, married people want to be single, single people want to be married. Um, I heard a, one of our our black pastor friends, because they get more, they're actually better at the teaching about sex and stuff than we are in, in the white congregation. That's the truth. But he said, he said, I'm constantly having to preach the married people into bed and the unmarried out of it. And that, you know, so we, we just, there are things that happen. And, and some of it we have to recognize, it really is normal life that we just need to recognize what we're dealing with. And you'll have a lot less offenses and a lot less unforgiveness going on in your marriage or your family or your relationships. Amen? I know I'm prob we probably get some comments about this one, but oh well. I'm telling the truth. And if you listen, it'll help you. Amen? Amen. So, don't, when I'm offended, don't assume that you know what the other person is thinking. That's Satan's realm. He wants you to think that stuff that didn't happen. And we're going to give an example of that, and then I'm going to wind this up. Um, I want to skip over to this. Are we having fun yet? Actually, before I get over to that, what if someone's very bitter against um, your pastor, your church, or a leader, or your boss? How do you deal with that? We need to touch base on that before I move on to the next thing. That's a touchy one. And I know we've all dealt with it. I mean, we deal with it. We have to be real careful because people who will, you know, we've, passed, we've been in full-time ministry since 1988. So people who will come from another place and want to tell us all about their pastor... Um, and what's wrong with them? I'm going to tell you something that you probably aren't going to like to heal, hear, but in, the, in our book, you're marked because you're going to do that to me. You're going to do that to him if you did that to them. Now, when someone leaves, God told me to leave, and you know we had the greatest pastor or whatever, but I just know it's time to leave. We're good. It's just the way it is. So what if somebody comes to you? Because this is how so many churches end up in church splits, right? How many have been? We've been through that, um, through that kind of turmoil in the church. And the devil, if he can't get you to not be saved, he wants to make your life miserable while you're saved. I mean, he, if he can't stop you, then he just wants to make your life miserable. So when somebody comes to you, what do you do? Are you going to sit down and listen to everything that they say? Don't do that. Don't. No, we won't. We won't listen to it. Um, first of all, I tell people my ears are not garbage cans. There's some things you don't need to hear. And, and when someone's, has a, uh, an offense, their, their focus, like we talked about with the gorillas coming through there and the, the curtains changing, all they're seeing is what they can, they're mad. They're missing all kinds of other stuff that's going on, but they only see one thing. So what you do, you do have a heart of compassion. You should love, because there again, we're not fighting flesh and blood, we're fighting principalities and powers, we're fighting Satan. So you can sit down and say, okay, um, 
what we need to do, it, when they start saying that, listen, this is what we need, we need to go and confront this individual, whoever it is. Now, if they're willing to confront it, you, you know, and you're willing to go with them, um, you know, for whatever, um, then they have a heart after God and they'll do it. If they don't do it, they don't have a heart after God. They're walking in a fence. You need to walk away and not listen anymore because it's not going to do you any good. That Bible talks about a root of bitterness that defiles many. And it causes, and it, it just spews things. So, and, and don't hate the person. We have to reckon, they are hurting now. I want you to make sure that we got that. I hope I'm making that clear. That person, it, they're, they're in pain. They're suffering. They're hurting. And to them, you know, it's just, so I'm not saying to, but you don't, you don't want to hear all of that, and you don't want to participate in that, because you'll end up getting offended for them or with them. And chances are, you might not even know the person they're talking about to boot. It could be somebody, you know, another a friend that, goes somewhere that you don't even know the pastor or the whoever they're talking about so um but don't open your ears up to defilement realize the person is offended they need to be healed and and you can even say hey i sense that you have a real root of bitterness there and, and um you, you really need to get healed and see because if they really want help they'll open up and they'll let you pray with them and let you help them on that and and then again pray for god's wisdom because there's not a, i can't give you a one two three abc there's not one so we need to use wisdom. Remember, the Bible definition of offense is ordinarily, ordinarily of anything that arouses prejudice, becomes a hindrance to others, or causes them to fall by the way. The Greek word for offense is, was the name of the part of a trap to which the bait is attached, hence the trap or snare itself. The Greek word also means to stumble. If we take an offense, we'll create an occasion to stumble, so we don't want to do that. And Satan will use people as a bait and a stumbling block to you. So a rock, it can be either a rock of offense or it can be a stepping stone. I choose to make it a stepping stone because I don't want to stumble. And um, we've had some situations, um, no, all of us have. That y the reason I want to get this across, if you're asking God for direction in any way, shape, or form in your life, or you're looking for things and, and you have an offense, you have a blockage to hearing. So you really need to, it's almost like we need a spiritual detox sometimes to just get rid of all that stuff because it poisons you. It does not poison the other. And then if you're trying to make godly decisions, you can't hear because you've got all this offense going on. Amen. And Webster talks about the act of creating resentment, hurt feelings, displeasure, con condition of being offended, especially feeling hurt or resentful and even angry. And then we talked about Acts chapter 24, 15. So Paul said, so I strive to keep my conscience clear before God and man. Just try, that's a good thing to do. Try to keep your conscience clear before God and man. And as Eddie's dad's always said, every tub has to sit on its own bottom. So when you get to heaven, God's not going to say, let you say, well, so-and-so or such-and-such, it was that snake, it was that woman, it was that man. No, it's all about you at that point, you and God, and, and he is looking at you. Um. Yeah, let's look at this. You got about 10 more minutes in you, in your sitter? Do you need to stand up or move or anything? You all good? We're good? Okay. Mark chapter 6, verse 1 through 6. Mark chapter 6, verse 1 through 6. Jesus left there and went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. And when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked, with what wisdom has, he, has been given him that he even does miracles? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Say, and they took offense at him. At who? At Jesus. It, imagine that. He has suffered everything we have. They took offense at him. Jesus said to them, only in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own house as a prophet without honor. He could not do any miracles there except lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he, and he was amazed at their lack of faith. Offenses will stop your miracles from coming. It stops you from hearing. It stops. It's just like you're stuck. I don't know how else to put it. I stuck. I stuck. When you get offended, you just can't move forward. And we want to move forward. So we need to get rid of those offenses for us, not for the other person. It's all about you. They're being used to Satan. You don't want Satan to get to you through them. So we need to just let that thing go because, because of their offenses. He couldn't even heal a bunch of them. He couldn't even do what, what he wanted to do in the place. He's like, all right, I can't do it. And I, and I want to say this about healing because, you know, we've, we used to do a lot of healing services. Um, 
there's a lot of facets to healing and there's a lot of things that there are progressive healings there's a you know mirac uh what do you call it instant healings thank you but there are all of these different things that go into an, and and sometimes what you know people say well what what's wrong with that situation there's a, a part in the bible that said that um this was just so that the glory of God could be revealed. There was nothing wrong. God just wanted to get glory out of the situation, and he did. So, but this is just one area. If you're having something, then maybe you've had it for a couple years or whatever. Um, check and make sure offenses is not what's stopping your miracle, stopping your financial blessing, stopping whatever it is you're believing for, because um, that is one of the ways that could stop it up. And I say one, because there's too many variables to just say that's it across the board. Amen? Now, this is what I wanted to get to, 2 Kings chapter 5. That's why I wanted a few more minutes. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 1. We used to sing this song in Bible, vacation Bible school when I was a little girl. Um, and, it, and his name was Nahum, and his name was Nahum. And he dipped, then he dipped. We got to dip seven times. I remember that. <laughs> we got to do the motions of dipping. But Naaman... I know you love that part. Now, Naaman was a commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him, the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier. Say he was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Verse 2, now the bands from Aram had gone out and he had taken captive a young girl from Israel and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of the leprosy. Naam went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naam left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, 10 sets of clothing, and the letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. Now the king's panicking. He's like, I can't cure somebody of leprosy. So verse 7, he goes, as soon as the king read the letter, he tore his robes and said, am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me? Well, right there, the king could have gotten offended because he's like, he's trapping me. I can't heal leprosy. Why in the world is he sending him to me? So verse 8 said, when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you turn, torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and, I, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Nahum went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Verse 10, Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. Now, he's a valiant man. He's a man of, of prominence, Nahum was. And the prophet doesn't even come himself. He sends his servant so already we're seeing an offense being set up here, if you're paying attention. Verse 11, but Nahum went away angry. Said, so he said to himself, he says, I thought that the man of God would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over me in the spot of, and cure me of my leprosy. How many times have you or I had preconceived ideas of what people were going to do or how things were going to happen, and we got offended? And that's exactly what happened with Nahum. Nothing's new under the sun. The Bible tells us that. We're all, I mean, we, there's just nothing new. And that's why it's so easy for the enemy to get through to us because he knows that better than we do sometimes. And um, so he, he was angry and he was like, I thought. So I know I've been there. I thought that he got it that I wanted the roses and the dinner on my anniversary. Um, you know how many, but, I, but you do. You go into situations where I thought that they would understand this. So he had a preconceived idea of what Elisha, the prophet, was going to do. And when he didn't do it, he, he got furious and offended. And verse 12, aren't there not, and, and are not, now he's doubly offended, are not Abana and Farfar, the rivers of Damascus, better than any of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned off and he went in a rage because he told him to dip in the Jordan River, and the Jordan River is really dirty and nasty. So he's like, there are nice rivers. If I have to dip in something, what's wrong? First he sends his servant, now he asks me to dip in dirty water. So verse 13, Naaman's servants went to him and said, my father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, you would have done it because you're a valiant man. How much more than when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So Naaman went down, dipped himself seven times, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clear like that of a young boy. So we need to be careful that we don't have expectations and preconceived ideas because that will lead you into an offense. 
because generally if it's you think it's going to go a certain way, 99% of the time it's not going to happen that way. You get offended at God even. No, none of us would do that. But I have been offended at God because I thought he should have done it this, this, and this way, and it didn't happen that way. So we need to even, I've had to say, Lord, forgive me because I'm offended at you. Um, but there are things like that or, or situations that we get into. That just, I'm trying to show you so that you'll start recognizing if you see the offense coming and you realize what's going on, you can avoid it and walk in peace and have a lot nicer life. Amen? So if we assume a response and we don't get that response, we get offended and we don't want to do that. Amen? Amen. Did you know that, well, we do have, I've got five more minutes. How many of you believe that Jesus is love and that he had pure love? He walked in pure love, right? All right. How many believe that Jesus was full of the Holy Ghost and power and went about doing good, like it says in, in Hebrews? There was just nothing bad about him. He did all good. All right, well, let's turn to First Peter chapter 2. This really helped me. So I hope I believe it'll help you. First Peter chapter two, verse six. For in the scripture it says, "See, I lay in st- I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in Him, which is Jesus, He's talking about, will never be put to shame." Verse seven. Now, to you who believe, this stone is precious. But the but so if you believe, He is precious to you. Jesus is a precious cornerstone. But if you don't believe. It says the stone that the builders rejected has become the capstone and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them to fall. So how c- the question is, how can someone who is pure love cause somebody to stumble and be, and be offended at them? Because that person's not choosing to walk in love. You can be walking in the best that you know and your heart be right towards people like we talked about before and them get offended at you. And I have a good example that just came to my mind. We have, now none of you have family troubles, right? <laughs> and I'm going to be real careful how I say this. Oh, Lord, help me. But I, you need to hear this. We had a family member who did a really offensive thing against many members of our family and was very offensive. And at first, I was like, I was getting, joining the, I'll just be honest, I got an offense, and I joined the gang with, we'll never invite that person over to dinner, and they're not part of our family anymore. How could they have done that? Blah, blah, blah. And, and mind you, it was, it was a big one, and it was really hurtful. But that's still not right. Years later, times passed, I'm a, in a generally... And, and I realize this about me, so I know it's harder for some people than it is for me. I'm generally a forgiver. It's, and I have to tell you, I believe it's because the more you do it, the easier it gets, too. So I can, you know, so I'm just like, you know what? Can't change it. And I, I just don't believe God wants me to stay offended and upset with this person. And it's, not, it's nothing that you can go back and change now. It's done. It's something that can't be changed. There was no, there's no restitution that could be made. So what is that person supposed to do? So what did I do come Christmas or whatever? I invited the person over with the family. I feel the anointing here. And I got some grief from other family members like, how could you? They did such and such and so and so. And I said, it's my house. I've chosen to forgive. And this is something else. Because I did... One by one, the rest of the family members began to forgive. So it's important. It's not always, you know, we forget about that. But sometimes when we make that choice, it also will lead other people to do the right thing. But even recently, and I know probably to be a good sermon example, right, but it came up again. And someone said, I don't want, um, you forget what they did. I said, I have not forgotten. I don't care. It's done. They can't change it. And I've chosen. I even pray, I've said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And he said, I want you to basically not pass judgment and to handle them with kid gloves. Because this person is a hurting person. And God loves her as much as he loves us. And it's hard for us to realize. I mean, God loves the worst defiled. He loves the person that, um, that killed 
the embassy person, I mean, we for, because he does. He loves them. He wants to bring them all in, whether they choose to or not. So there are times when we're walking in love, and people will get offended at you because you're walking in love. I hope my example, I think you're following me, right? So even when you choose to walk in love, don't be surprised if somebody gets offended at you for choosing because what that does, it's almost like a mirror. They have to see that they're wrong. But does that, don't, don't worry. I mean, if they're not comfortable, that's their issue. Don't make it yours. And so, and, I, and it's easy too, when they start that stuff, I almost started to grab the offense again. And I'm like, no, not going there because this is not God. So we need to just recognize that even when you're, you know, Jesus didn't do anything wrong. People that are offended is because they don't want to walk in love. They don't want to follow Jesus. And I'm going to close with that because we have one more week to go through this. And <laughs> I probably should have had ten weeks. But um, I hope this is helping y'all. It's helping me. I want everybody's eyes closed. If you, I don't want anyone looking around. I'm going to be the only one looking around. If, um, if you are not 100% sure today that if you were to die, you're going to heaven, I want you to raise your hand. Is there anybody? And even if you're watching on YouTube, is there anybody there that doesn't know if you were to die today, you'd go to heaven? Raise your hand. Okay. Well, I'm going to go ahead and have everybody pray this prayer because um, we don't know who's watching today. So, Father... I come to you in the name of Jesus. And I believe Jesus Christ is the only Son of God. I believe Jesus died on a cross for me, that he rose from the dead, and that he is my way to heaven. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I receive forgiveness of my sin. I receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I acknowledge that when I die, I'm going to heaven. And I want to say to you as a minister of the gospel, if you prayed that prayer, you indeed are going to heaven when you die. And you have received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And if you will email us, um, we, will try to, we will get you some furthering uh, material to help you on your walk with God. So just look down there about that. Now, everybody, eyes close again. I want to do one more thing. If you are, you know that God's dealt with you in about an, an offense today, and you want to um, to deal with that, I want you to raise your hand. Okay, see those hands? And even on the thing, I see those hands. Yes, thank you. Also on the on the video, we know that you're out there, and you got. <laughs> Because you've raised your hand, I'm telling you now, is there anybody else? You're going to be so set free today. It's, I just hear the Spirit saying you are going to be so, you're going to feel light as a feather when you walk out. Anybody else? I'll give you a minute. Jesus. If you want to come up for prayer, um, I would really like to pray with you today. I don't always do this, and I don't want to embarrass anyone. Um, but if you would like prayer today, I invite you to come forward. We'll pray, and if not, we're going to pray a group prayer. But I'll give you a few seconds to decide that. Okay, just repeat this prayer after me. Father, just everybody say it. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. And I recognize I've been walking in offense. I don't want to be offended anymore. And I choose to forgive those people who have offended me. And I want us to stop here for a few minutes and you just tell God, between you and, the, and go through the list of people that he brings to your mind and, and just one by one ask, say, I forgive so-and-so. And you can do that underneath your breath because it it's no one else's business.
All right, let's continue the prayer. And Father, I thank you that you've forgiven me as I've forgiven them. I decree I'm free from offenses. I'm free from unforgiveness. And I receive everything that you have for me. I receive healing for my body, my mind, my finances, my relationships. I choose to walk in love. And I give you permission, Father, to, to help me know when offense is coming. I give you permission to wake me up out of my sleep if you need to deal with me about anybody. I receive your love. I receive everything that you have for me. <laughs> and I decree it's a new day. I'm going to walk in peace. I'm going to walk in joy and righteousness and love in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, you're free. Even if you don't feel anything, I'm guaranteed throughout the week. And if uh, I'm looking forward to some testimonies here and there. And um, how, how many just feel lighter just by, you know, it says the word just comes and it will cleanse you just by hearing it. It's just awesome. Well, next week, what's happening? Covered dish dinner. How many of you will come? <laughs>